Hi, it's Noel Williams, May 26, 2020, COVID update, um, Director of Optimal Health Associates in Oklahoma City. Uh, real interesting data set today out of the CDC, pretty confirmatory to what I talked about yesterday, which was funny to me, uh, actually hitting the numbers right, doing calculations on a scratch pad when they have all those computers that they say don't work. Um, so interesting data there, we'll go over that. We'll also talk about exosomes, and uh, I welcome everyone nitpicking every comment I say about exosomes because I know it's a complicated subject and if I misspeak, uh, please forgive me slightly. Um, so statistics in the world, uh, 5.7 million, about 340,000 deaths roughly. Um, COVID is booming more now in the Southern hemispheres. It's a disease of the America, Central America um, and South America um, predominantly, um, not booming in Africa. Uh, about 100,000 new cases today. Um, North America, we're in the United States. We had about 18 to 19,000 new cases. We crested over 100,000. We have about 100,500 deaths, unfortunately. Oklahoma, uh, about 6,000 cases, still 311 deaths. So we're pretty stable, not, not a lot of growth there, which is good news. We'll have to see what happens over the weekend. There was, um, you know, like at spring break, there was tons of pictures of people congregating together. And again, remember, there was no pulse after that because it illustrates, again, it's patterns. 20-somethings don't spread the disease that much. Are they going to occasionally get it? Yes. I want to be very clear about that. Yes. People will eventually get it at younger ages, but they don't die. That's the key concept. I mean, the case fatality rates, which we'll go over, are remarkably low for uh people under 34 and really under 45 so it's just again they can get get it occasionally but they don't get sick and they certainly don't die almost ever um, and we'll hit those numbers again if you just think about um, what's the risk of death for someone under 14 is about one in six million if for someone under uh, 19 um, it's somewhere in the range of about one in a million or less um, for someone under 24, it's around the same. If you subtract out people who have significant medical illnesses already, it becomes astronomically low. For the under 24 year old group, the 25 to uh, 39 or 35 year old group is about one in 50,000. Um, and but again, if you subtract out the um, morbidity group it again plummets to one in several hundred thousand and it kind of goes up to that so the key concept with statistics is besides the fact that you can make statistics do anything is we are getting more statistics and the whole purpose of everything with the mitigation strategy was to stop the surge which was successful um, and then number two learn and change and adjust and if we don't learn change and adjust based on data there's no point in collecting data and we might as well just all put our heads in the sand and and not think. And so this, uh, like anything, if you're a lemming or a sheep, uh, this isn't the lecture for you or the discussion for you. So let's talk about some CDC data that came out today. And it's a huge shift because what they did is they started to show the infected death rate, the real one. So the number in the United States has been 6.5%. Well. Now that they're looking at it a little more and they're looking at the, the R interval, which is the number of people who are infected, um, the case fatality rate, if you're infected, is actually really, really low. If you look, and I have to have these numbers up here because it's hard to um, keep them all straight. And I love the CDC because the CDC doesn't um, break the numbers down in, in a way that makes COVID realistic. They keep them in large lumps, which is, really frustrating. So they did the first lump, those under 49. I would have liked to have seen it at, like they do a lot of the statistics at under one, over one to five, over five to nine, and thus and so through the whole age group. They didn't do that. They said 49 and under. If you get the infection, your case fatality rate is 0. 0.0005. What does that mean? That means if you have 100,000 people get the infection, in that group, 50 will die, okay, 50 roughly, in a worst case scenario. Um, if you subtract out the people who are in 
with morbidities and mortalities, it totally shifts the number. And they made an assumption that only a, th a third of people who are infected are asymptomatic. And I think the current data across the rest of the world is it's minimally f at least 50% of the people are asymptomatic and it's probably 90 to, uh, I mean, probably 9, 10, 12, maybe even 20 to 1 symptomatic asymptomatic versus symptomatic. So this number is going to shift, but it's 50 per 100,000 and infected for under 49. So a really teeny tiny amount, especially compared to influenza, which was, or excuse me, Spanish flu, which was 600 to 700. Um, then if you look at 50 to 64, it goes to 200 per um, 100,000. And again, that is in the infected group um, and then in the older group, the people who are over 65, it goes to about 1,300 per 100,000, um, which is a more significant number. But the thing that's interesting about that number is if we made one simple decision different in Connecticut, New Jersey, New York, that number would be totally different. And that was the decision if we would have, and I'm again, this is, a retrospective scope I'm not being critical but I you have to be able to talk about things that maybe were the wrong choice um, without knowing it sending infected COVID patients who were not in need of hospitalization back to their nursing homes it looks like killed an extra 12 to 15,000 people in those three states so because they just went back and got everybody else infected so if you look at the rest of the country for that age group it's way better but that's why that number so high was a, a critical decision that ended up being the wrong critical decision to make. Um, and probably the single most devastating um, decision in terms of death rates was sending infected COVID patients back to their nursing homes. I mean, in re it seems pretty obvious now, but that's a big deal. And so when then, when, so you, when you mishmash all this together, what does that really say about COVID death rates? Well, the actual rate of death from COVID, if you look across if you just take the whole country based on this data, your overall risk is about one in 166,000 if you're an older person. I mean, over, let's say you're over 40. I mean, it's an incredibly tiny amount. If you're under 40, it's so low, it's, it's not really contemplatable, is the bottom line. And because of that, and knowing that now, we have to adjust. We have to adjust. Schools need to be open. It, it's clear, kids do not spread the virus to adults almost ever, they, they don't. I mean, that's what the data is showing. So if kids don't shed, spread the virus to adult, adults that often, and it's really hard for them to get it, school should be open. Now, can an adult affect a child? Yes, and let's talk about that scenario. Where has that really become clear? Wuhan, China, which I've talked about, New York City, you have an affected, infected adult you send them home to a condo or an apartment and you just let that person sit there like a Petri dish with the family and you get, um, um, again, a phrase I've used many times, immersion, subversion. You immerse that small nucleus of family in, in viral particles for a week or two while they're quarantining and you're gonna actually overcome the kid's immune system and get them sick or get them infected. But the question is, do they get sick? And the answer is no. Kawasaki disease, which is not going up, or this, what they have a new acronym for it, which has occurred. We still don't know if it's directly from COVID and even if it is from COVID. It is so rare that it's not something to seriously contemplate as an issue to inhibit people becoming functional. And that's what this is becoming now. It's becoming important to get over the fear of become functional. And that's my firm opinion based on science and statistics. I mean, if you're on vitamins, which I've said a million times, you're taking some zinc, you're exercising a little, you're going outside, you're relaxing and meditating, or not that I meditate, but try to relax, do things to help you relax, your immune system's going to work and it's going to be really hard for you to get sick. Now, again, if you're older, obese, have diabetes, hypertension, and you're kind of a little bit of a medical train wreck, you do need to be more careful. But you have to make that choice and make those decisions, and I think that would be very helpful for you. Just add a vitamin. If you add a vitamin, your immune system's gonna be better. Now, where do masks come in? 
I think A, people who wear masks are being courteous, so don't be mean to them. They are not gonna be super impactful for the people who are wearing them unless you're wearing a good mask and you have it on correctly. And a good mask is a KN95 or a 95. Those ones are gonna be a little protective to you. Otherwise, cloth masks and other masks, their main function is to block your secretions from leaving. They're not super effective at that, but they're fairly effective at that. Just like if you cough into your arm, that is gonna be way better than just coughing out and if you have the virus. But again, the masks are helpful, but I don't think they're anything people should get worked up about in either direction um, because it's a courteous movement. Now, the exception would probably be on airplanes. Airplanes are a confined space. You probably wanna wear a mask just to protect those around you and to have some minimal per further protection yourself. If you're on a plane, I think you should be sucking on zinc lozenges and you should wipe your area down with um, a Lysol wipe or something um, and bring your own water on the plane. So those are the basic concepts tonight for COVID. Uh, in terms of exosomes, exosomes are bilipid bubbles that cells secrete, okay? Cells secrete them. But if a virus gets in a cell, it in affects the cellular metabolism and the exosomes will start to secrete viral DNA and RNA in the exosomes. So exosomes, I we use in our practice uh, as both for injection and inhalation, um, both IV and, and then in tissue planes and then in, in inhalation if we wanna try to get more in the brain rapidly. Those are from placental uh, sources and they contain tons and tons of uh, messenger RNA healing proteins and peptides and growth factors. And so they are a way of addressing um, serious diseases like kidney failure, potentially Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, neuropathy, autoimmune diseases, and turning them down. So that's one thing, that's the clinical use for exosomes because exosomes go to where you're inflamed. They're amazingly effective for innumerable hard to treat things. But exosomes are secreted by cells. So let's transition to someone like me. So if I injure the, my shoulder here, the cells in that area that got injured are gonna secrete exosomes. And those little packets that they're releasing are gonna contain inflammatory mediators that are not positive and they're irritative. If I get COVID, I'm going to have that virus get into the cell and the cell's going to process viral particles and release inflammatory mediators. And some of those releases in the exosome or the bubbles are gonna contain messenger RNA and DNA from the virus that can then hit another cell and infect that cell It's a, with the DNA from the virus. So it's an interesting concept that both the virus can affect the cell, but the cell that's infected can release exosomal products containing viral DNA that can infect the other cell. And that's been well documented for those listening and want uh, in with Epstein-Barr virus. Um, so again, just trends. Cancer cells secrete exosomes too, and those exosomes can have all different types of mediators in them that are not pleasant for the person, including inflammatory mediators, uh, vascular mediators that can cause clot, uh, uh, DNA from the um, cancer itself, and, but one thing that can occur is diagnostically, we'll be at a point in the next few years where when you get blood work done, you can do diagnostic testing for exosomes, which is much more sensitive than for proteins normally. Because an exosomal secretion from a cell can be in the billions and billions of exosomes from one cell, and that gets in the bloodstream. And so if you can detect them, you could potentially detect cancer earlier or inflammatory disease processes earlier and a whole bunch of really interesting stuff. And also you could detect viruses earlier and bacterial infections. Um, so that's the wave of the future with testing. So exosomes, really cool stuff. Use them clinically, great. But they're also uh, a notable thing for diseases as they affect cells, whether it's a virus infecting a cell or whatever. There's also other products and things um, that we use that are like exosomes. There's something called Wharton's Jelly, which is from the cord, and that contains healing inflammatory mediators. And interestingly enough, the Chinese have used stem cells, exosomes, and Wharton's Jelly uh, to treat incredibly ill COVID patients successfully because it turns off the um, autoimmune aberrant response, which is why it can work for RA, but it also 
um, can be very successful for compassionate use in um, people with COVID. And the company we've used, Extensive Medical, donated a million dollars of product to different hospitals around the country for compassionate use of very sick COVID patients. So I hope that helps. Did that address the exosome thing you think enough? Or I did I miss? So. If it didn't, I'm sure there'll be questions. Yeah, there'll be questions. questions. So, <laughs> and, um, you know, some of this stuff is pretty complicated, and I'm making it as easy to understand as I can, but it is complicated stuff and takes a lot of time to read and understand. And thankfully, like with exosomes, I've been reading about them since October of 2019 and utilizing them in the practice since November. So I have, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of hours reading journal articles and understanding. But some of the stuff with the statistics, it is tough stuff. I mean, to figure out all this data and take it and scratch it out and say, what does this mean? So just remember, it's an ongoing effort to be direct and to all the school people, and the students and people with students, your kids should be able to go to school. The teachers are gonna be okay. The kids aren't gonna get them sick. They need to wash their hands, take their vitamins, and they're gonna be fine. Now, the one final caveat to all of this is if there's a massive second wave, we may have to readjust. I mean, that's just reality because if there's a huge second wave and a huge, again, ascending numbers of older people getting really sick, we may have to figure something out because the key solution isn't to, I think, abbreviate people under 40s lives or 50s lives, but unless they're sick, but people who are older need to stay home. And that's what's going to need to happen because they're the ones who can get sick or people with significant disease. Um, so that's how you make society work as you focus now on the groups that are at risk. So thank you very much. Have a pleasant night and a great week.